in January of 1956. There they had hoped to meet the tribe and begin talking to them about Jesus. To their surprise, they were attacked by the men of the village, speared to death and thrown in the water. Years later, Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth, and Steve Saint's sister, Rachel, were introduced to the same tribe through the same girl, Dayuma. They lived amongst this tribe for years. During this time, Dayuma became a Christian and taught many members of the tribe about Christ, including a member called Minkai. Today, families of the missionaries remain close to the many members of this tribe. Nate Saint's son, Stephen, became close to this man named Minkai. The twist is, he's the one who killed his father. Minkai accepted Christ and adopted Steve as his son, his tribal son. Steve's children called Minkai grandfather Minkai. Today, Minkai become, became a minister and he ministers to his tribe. They are no longer known as a violent tribe. They are not all saved, but many are. I have a picture um, of Minkai and Steve Saint. Uh, Ryan's not up there. Do you have it, Amanda? All right, we'll show it some other time. But they are very close, and like I said, they call each other father and son. There's Minkai, there's Steve Saint. What a powerful story of redemption and forgiveness. But in my finite mind, I have to ask a few questions. Why and how did Jim Elliott and the missionaries spend so much time trying to reach this tribe? They were known as savages. They killed everybody who came close to them. What put it in their heart to reach these people? How did Jim Elliott's wife and Steve Saint's sister find it in their hearts to go live with this tribe after their family members were killed? And how can Steve Saint call Minkai dad? How do these people forgive? Last week, Pastor Tom preached on Ephesians 4, and he mentioned the things that make it very hard to forgive. Many of us can relate to it. Today, we're going to focus on how much God forgives us. How many of you would consider yourself hospitable? You enjoy being a host? Not me, sorry. But being a host, there's things that come with it, right? There's things, if you're going to have somebody over of importance or somebody that you're looking forward to seeing, you're going to do a few things. You're going to get out the fine china. You're going to get out the best silverware you got. You're going to clean the house, light a candle. Just make it very welcoming, right? How many of you guys have had a party where you had certain people in mind that were coming and then somebody showed up that wasn't invited? Not fun. Well, today... We're going to talk about a story in the Bible where there was a dinner party and an uninvited guest showed up and crashed the party. Let's meet the two characters in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. First, we have Simon the Pharisee. The word Pharisee means separated one. It appears 98 times in the New Testament. Please know I'm not Grouping all Pharisees together, but for the sake of this sermon, we are speaking about a certain group of Pharisees that were very hypocritical. They are teachers of the law of Moses. However, they were extremely legalistic in their approach. To them, it was more about works rather than the heart behind it. They were self-righteous people, and they were at odds with Jesus during this time. They didn't like that he was raising the dead, healing the sick, speaking with such authority. He was disrupting their comfort. See, Jesus associated with sinners, and they felt we were, they, that they were above sinners. Jesus loved the poor, and they looked down upon the poor. Jesus forgave, they condemned. Jesus is very clear on how he feels about this group of Pharisees. In Matthew 23 and Luke 11, he calls them hypocrites. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. They weren't practicing what they preached. 
And we know in James uh, chapter 1, verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. If we continue in Matthew 23, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move, move them with so much as a finger. Unfortunately, there's a lot of modern day Pharisees in us. And I found a list and it's not a fun list by any means, but it definitely woke me up a little bit. And that's what scripture should do. It should show us the truth. But here's the first thing on the list. You believe showing up every Sunday makes you right with God. You spend more time talking about what you are against rather than what you are for. You believe that God needs you. You feel you have no sin to repent of. You make every issue black and white and refuse to see the gray. You would, rather, you would never condone sin, but you have no problem watching it on TV or in movies. You feel your works will make you right with God rather than the heart behind it. You read your Bible out of conviction rather than to spend time with God and grow closer. Outsiders need to fit a certain mold before they're allowed in this church. All your friends look and act like you do and you get angry when you're rebuked by others. I said, it's a tough list. And as I was reading the list, I was saying, yeah, guilty, guilty, eh, yeah, guilty. We all have a little Pharisee in us, don't we? The next character we want to talk about is the woman. We don't know much about her. She is unnamed. And based on the context, she is a prostitute. Um, we see that in several of the details. There weren't a lot of professions then, and uh, certain actions proved that she was a prostitute. Her sin was a sexual nature. But she was known publicly for this sin, and um, we don't know her name, like I said. Many scholars are trying to say that she's Mary of Bethany, or Mary Magdalene, and there's not enough proof to make that to be true. So she's an unnamed woman, she's a sinner, that's all we know. And that leads us to our text this morning. Verse 36. Now one of the Pharisees were, was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. The word reclined was kind of interesting to me, I don't know why, but it was. And um, they didn't have lazy boys, so I was like, what do they mean by reclined? And. Uh, I was going to demonstrate it on the floor, but I recently hurt my back a little, so I'm not going to because I won't make it back up to preach the rest. But just think of it as this. There's the table on the floor, and there's cushions to make sort of like a sofa, and they lay down on their elbow and reach to the table and eat like this with their feet behind them. All right? So you get the picture. So the, the Pharisee invites Jesus over to the party. They're reclining at the table. Um, there's a picture of the Pharisee. He was most likely well-to-do. He had a nice house. It was very common in those days to invite rabbis over. Um, Pharisees loved to tell everybody, hey, I'm having an important person over tonight. Come check it out. Uh, they had a courtyard in the middle of the courtyard. Um, the, tab the table was in the middle of the courtyard, excuse me. And the custom was that the rabbi would come to dinner and everybody was invited, even the poor. See, the poor were invited because they hoped to get some scraps. That's how the Pharisee felt about the poor. But this explains how the woman in verse 37 was able to enter in. And behold, there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. It clearly states that she's a sinner. That's, we don't know much, but God says a sinner. And everyone knew of her sin, public, not hidden. When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair on her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Most of us have heard the other stories in the Gospels about the alabaster vial of perfume. It's not the same story by any means, but alabaster definitely means expensive. And she brought it to Jesus And standing behind him, at his feet weeping, she was wetting his feet with her tears. First, what in the world are you doing here? 
Nobody invited you. Yes, it was made known that we were having Jesus over, but what in the world are you doing here? You're a sinner. You're not allowed in the Pharisee's house. They would look down upon you. Why are you here? Second, what are you doing to Jesus? Weeping, kissing his feet, anointing him with perfume. Well, remember when I asked you if you were hospitable and what you did as a host? Well, back then, they were supposed to do certain things that were customary of host. And Simon failed to do each and every one of these things. First, it was customary to wash the feet of your guest. Keep in mind, they wore sandals back then. Some didn't. And when they entered the house, they were taking their sandals off, and their feet were being washed. If you think about those times, they shared the roads with many animals. So there's no telling what was on their feet. I have a funny story. Um, I was in a play, and uh, I, didn't do, I haven't done many plays, but my wife was in this play, and it was a great play. It was called The Gift. It was at Valley, and um, we had a great time doing it, but they go all out. They go all out at this, at this play. They have live animals, right? And I was fortunate enough to be Matthew, the disciple, but I have size 16 feet, so I couldn't find any sandals, so I was bare, barefoot, and... We were about to do our scene with Hosanna, march in Jesus with the donkey and wave our palm branches. And I was petting the donkey, and uh, all of a sudden the donkey decided to let something out. <laughs> and being that I have such big feet, and I don't know if you've ever seen a donkey do that, but it's like a machine gun. It's just <laughs> There's no getting around it, no doubt. So the show must go on. I don't know where it's at. It's kind of dark. I'm like, Lord, get me through this. So the doors open, the keychain happens, and I step in it. But the show must go on. Hosanna, Hosanna. Really, honestly, I was singing, oh, man, this wasn't part of the plan. Uh, how, how, what am I going to do right now? Like, the next scene was the Last Supper. That wasn't a fun scene. But you get the picture. You don't know what was on their feet, so it was customary for them to wash the feet. Many of us, if somebody had mud on their shoes, you wouldn't want them in your house with their shoes, right? Strike one, Simon. You did not offer him water for his feet, so the woman used her tears to wash his feet. Second, guests were greeted with a kiss of peace. We see this in many places in the New Testament, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians. In each instance, the Greek words denote a kiss, which is sacred, physically pure, and morally blameless. It was a common custom in most nations for people to kiss each other at a meeting or party to display their love, sincere, excuse me, display their love, sincere affection, and friendship for each other. The kiss was called holy to distinguish it from a sexual one and from a hypocritical one like Joab or Judas. Jesus received no kiss of peace. The woman kissed his feet, showing her affection towards him. The love she displayed was pure and innocent. It was a sign of humility and love. Finally, guests were anointed with perfume or oil since there wasn't any deodorant. All right, so again, I want to have made it back then. Between my feet and no deodorant, nobody would have allowed me in their home, okay? Uh, you know, you could ask my wife on that one. So. But they, they were anointed with perfume. Strike three, he did not anoint Jesus. The woman used the expensive bottle of perfume that cost a year's worth of wages, so we're told, to anoint Jesus' feet. We see in Psalm 23, 5, this custom. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. See, the point we want to make this morning that God wants us to understand is that those of us who understand how much we, we have been forgiven are going to show it out of love for Jesus and others. This woman loved Jesus because she understood her debt. Simon had no clue about his debt because he didn't feel he had debt. He was a Pharisee. He only was concerned about other people and their sins. So why in the world does Simon have you over? Again, I mentioned they, don't, they didn't like what Jesus was doing. They didn't like how he was disrupting their comfort zone. 
So they probably had their notepads. There were no notepads then, but they were writing every little detail down to try to pin something on Jesus. They wanted to end his ministry and get rid of him. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw that saw this, he said to himself. So he sees what the woman's doing. He knows her as a sinner. In his mind, it's an evil act that she's doing. And he said to himself, this is very important that you understand. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this was touching him. She's a sinner. See, I, again, the Pharisees didn't understand their need for, for Jesus, for a Savior. They didn't understand. They didn't see themselves as sinners. They felt by keeping Moses' law, they were good enough. They were right with God. Well, did you know there's over 600 laws that they had to follow? plus many other laws that they implemented on their own. Pretty sure Simon wasn't able to follow all those. But in his mind, he saw no sin in him, only in others. He immediately judged both the woman and Jesus. He muttered to himself, if this guy was really a prophet, would he really be allowing this terrible sinner to touch him with her unholy, uncleansed hands, hair, and lips? He should throw her out and condemn her. Simon only saw her sin. Simon didn't get the essence of the faith that he claimed to be part of. There was no love. We don't see much love in Simon. See, Jesus wants us all to understand our debt that was paid for us. God knows that when we accept his mercy and grace, it's going to unleash love in us. It's going to unleash the new creation. We're going to be the people that we were called to be. We are all sinners, Simon. We all fall short of the glory of God. No matter what level of sin you think you have, wake up. We are all sinners, Simon. 1 John 1.8. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Jesus loves everyone and wants all of us to receive forgiveness here this morning. He even loved the Pharisee and wanted him to understand his need for forgiveness. But Jesus does something next where he says, I'll fix your unbelief, Simon. I just heard your unspoken request. You asked me if I'm a prophet. I'm going to tell you. Not only am I a prophet, I'm God. I know all your thoughts. I know exactly what the woman is. I know what she was. And I knew exactly what everything that was going to happen today. I'm sovereign. I'm God, Simon. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He, he knew what was going to happen that day, yet he still came. Because he wanted to teach us all the lesson on forgiveness and how much we've been forgiven here today. Simon spoke to himself, and Jesus answered. And that's where we see the parable in verse 41. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500, and the other owed 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them. Which one of them loved him more? This is what he asked Simon. Jesus is saying, when he says we're unable to repay, nobody could pay for sin on their own. No matter how much sin you think you have in your life, one sin violates God's command, God's standard. One sin makes you worthy of debt of death. He had two debtors. The money lender obviously was God in the parable. Simon and the woman, the two debtors. The one that owed 500 was the woman. She understood how much sin she had. She understood how much she needed a savior. She had a rough life. She made a lot of poor choices. She understood in her mind she couldn't do it on her own. She needed a savior. She needed forgiveness. Simon represents 50. Now it's been preached on many times, the 500 is a year and a half salary. It's a lot of money, depending on how much you make, but still, it's a lot of money. And the 50 was equated to a month's worth of salary. God does not care about how much sin you have. It's the fact that you are a sinner, and he wants to forgive you, each and every one of you here today. Simon was caught at this point. He knew that God was talking about him. And he admitted that he too 
Though he was a small sinner, he was still a sinner. You judged the woman incorrectly, Simon. She loved me because she was forgiven. She was showing gratitude and appreciation for being forgiven. Simon, Simon understood what Jesus was doing. He was openly rebuking Simon. Simon's heart was very cold towards sinners and lacked love. He was unable to see her true intentions. But now Jesus turns the attention to the woman at his feet. He shows Simon that her intentions were pure, not evil, like Simon assumed. Talking to Simon, he looks at the woman. He said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those, those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man? who even forgives sins. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. So all these men around, probably Pharisees, people of importance, um, they said it to themselves, it says, again. And Jesus answers them. He's proven to them that he is God, that he is more than a prophet. They didn't even want to consider him a prophet in the beginning. She's not the same woman, Simon. Well, before I say that, I wanted to make sure that we're not promoting works, a works gospel. It wasn't her works that saved her. It was her faith. Please remember that. It was her faith that saved her. It was not the actions that she did. It is for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, the two debtors represent all of us sinners. No matter how much sin you think you have in your life, you still have sin. Jesus used this parable to call not only Simon out, but us. We must acknowledge that we are sinners, whether we think it's a little or a lot. God has graciously forgiven us of our sin debt, sending Jesus Christ to the cross and taking our place. Do you understand this morning the debt that was paid for you? Do you understand your need for a savior, for forgiveness? Our understanding of our debt and what it cost Jesus will determine how we love and if we love. The woman got it right. She understood all that God had did for her. And she loved much. Simon didn't. He didn't understand his debt, therefore he didn't love much. To him he didn't owe God anything. His good deeds and religious acts were just fine. They would have got him to heaven. See, rather than love, Simon loathed. Rather than pardon, Simon punished. Rather than be humble, Simon was haughty. The unnamed woman understood her debt. Before she came to Simon's house, she was changed. If you really study the scripture, she was changed before she met, went into that house. She had a previous encounter with Jesus. She heard him speak. We don't know exactly but she was forgiven, and once she understood her forgiveness, you saw her acts of love. That's how we should be this morning when we understand that we are forgiven. We should love. All her sins, all our sins, past, present, and future, have been forgiven. Do we understand, really, how much we've been forgiven? See, the woman loved Jesus. She was humble. She was contrite. She repented of her sins. She accepted God's forgiveness and surrendered her life to him. Because she was forgiven, she loved him. See, I learned a lot from this woman. She understood her need of a savior, and her, her faith saved her. But if you see this picture, many times we just read this, this passage and kind of skip over it, but I see surrender. I see a life that a Christian should be having, should be living. I see complete surrender in this woman. First, she's at the savior's feet. She wanted to be close to him, but she's at his feet showing a sign of surrender. Second, she knew she would be judged going into Simon's house. They didn't want her there. As I've told you, Pharisees didn't like sinners. They told you you're a sinner, be gone, leave me alone. She marched right in there. 
She didn't care. And she sat right at the feet of Jesus. I see her being sold out, fully loving God. Do you care about what others think about your love for God? Do you hide it? Do you let the world see that you've been forgiven? Second, she was weeping. She was very sorry for her sins. She was contrite. She repented. She knew she needed a Savior. Her tears proved that. Do you understand your need for a Savior here this morning? Do you understand, even if you've been a Christian for a long time, I've been a Christian for 23 years, we all need Jesus. We all need to be forgiven because we sin daily, don't we? And this, this, this message isn't to condemn us. It's to convict us. It's for us to look in the mirror and understand we've taken for granted our salvation as Christians. Me included. Finally, she surrendered her material possessions. This is a hard one for everybody, but that, that perfume that was known to be expensive... She willingly gave it to Jesus. Are you holding on to something this morning? Not fully surrendered to God because you can't let go of something. See, once we realize our debt, we should love Jesus. In doing so, he will unleash the love in us to love others and to forgive others. We won't be so quick to judge others of their shortcomings. We will welcome people into this church. God accepts them where they are. We should as well. Where are you this morning? Are you a modern day Pharisee? Are you like the woman? Do you know how much you've been forgiven? Do your actions show it? I think we need to be reminded of what Jesus had to endure for us to be free, to be forgiven. And I am gonna warn you guys, the video I'm about to show is very violent. It depicts the crucifixion from the passion of the Christ. But I think we all need a wake-up call from time to time and get out of our little comfort zone. 23 years I've been a Christian. I've been in that comfort zone many times. It's a difficult scene to watch. It makes me cry every time. But we do, as Christians, have to understand how fortunate we are and what God did for us. And when we understand that, we should be loving much. We should be loving God, first of all, because God unleashes the new creation that we are supposed to be. God is no respecter of persons. We all have different levels of sins. Perhaps you're here this morning and you're saying, God can't forgive me. You have no idea what I did. Her sins were many, yet he forgave. I don't know what your sins are. Only God does. But God wants to forgive you. If you don't know Jesus this morning, he's here with open arms saying, I want to pardon your sins. All you have to do is repent and believe in me. And trust in my son and the sacrifice that you just saw on the screen. We were supposed to pay that debt. But Jesus did it for us. So many Bible characters sinned, yet God forgave them. David killed and took his soldier's wife, yet he was forgiven. You cannot out -sin forgiveness if you're willing to accept the sacrifice. Nothing disqualifies you this morning from God's grace and mercy. God forgives all sinners, even the biggest sinners. Just repent. It's the greatest decision you'll ever make this morning. Perhaps you're here this morning and you've never heard about Jesus, ever. It's the first time you've heard anybody talk about Jesus in this manner. You feel a little tug on your heart. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want to pray for you. If you want to talk with me after the service with Pastor Tom, with Pastor Ron, we would love to meet with you. As we reflect, I ask, 
If you've been forgiven this morning, are you loving much? Or have you gotten comfortable in your walk with Christ? And you have a little bit of a Pharisee in you. You're a little judgmental. A little prideful. I asked you this morning, how in the world was Steve Saint able to call Minkai father? He understood that he was forgiven. He understood that God loved everybody. He who is forgiving much, loves much. May we all learn from these two stories. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for the forgiveness that you have given us, Lord. We don't deserve it, yet you offer it, Lord, so freely. Lord, unleash the love in all of us, God. Help us to change this world, to advance your kingdom for your glory, God. It's not about us. It's not like the Pharisees thought. It's not about them. It's about you, Lord. God, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross, to pay the debt that we owed. Let us go out into our communities and love and forgive and grow and become that new creation that you have asked us to be. We love you, Jesus. It's in your precious name. Amen.